Welcome to the fifth annual Leadership St. Pete Alumni Association Inside the Corner Office event. We're so pleased you're choosing to spend your valuable time with us. This year, our event is being offered virtually in collaboration with our friends at the St. Pete Catalyst. My name is Paul Stelrick, and I'm the president of the Leadership St. Pete Alumni Association. Our association is designed to be an extension of the incredibly successful Leadership St. Pete program. As you may be aware, Leadership St. Pete is a six month in-depth educational experience into the inner workings of our great city. Designed to develop future leaders by providing access to networking and educational opportunities for up and coming people from all sectors of our community. Using that as a springboard, our Alumni Association continues to foster those same great experiences while creating lifetime connections with other leaders within our community. Again, let me thank our friends at the St. Pete Catalyst for their partnership in tonight's program. We're so grateful for their time and expertise in providing these two sessions. Our format for the event is a two-part virtual series. Inside the corner office was designed loosely to be modeled after the show Inside the Actor's Studio. Providing the moderator with an opportunity to have a candid and personal discussion between leaders sharing their experiences. Our moderator will guide the two speakers through a conversation about leadership lessons learned along the way and the role that the arts plays in our community now and into the future. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the program. We'll have time for Q&A from our virtual audience at the end. Tonight's program features arts executives as they share their experiences in leading organizations and driving growth in the vibrant arts community that St. Pete is so well known for. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, John Collins, Executive Director of the St. Petersburg Arts Alliance and a graduate of the LSP class of 2003. Hey John, take it away. Good evening. Thank you, Paul, and to LSPAA for inviting me to moderate this evening. I'll try to move quickly through my remarks so we can get to uh, the directors you want to hear from. As we look toward the future, how can our arts and cultural community prepare for the changes and opportunities that lie ahead? We look for leaders to create an inspiring vision of the future, to motivate and inspire people to engage with that vision, and to coach and build a team to effectively deliver that vision. Remember the saying, there's no I in team? Well, I guess that probably went out with the word groovy. But every team needs a leader and every good idea needs a champion to succeed. This LSPAA series provides us an opportunity to hear how our leaders are finding new and inventive ways to connect, engage, and foster creative outlays during this unprecedented time where the arts can serve a vital role to the expression of our human nature. The arts have long held the power to connect us to each other and ourselves. They also hold the power to heal. Unfortunately, during this pandemic, when arts are needed the most, our institutions have been forced to focus on their survival while reimagining their future. I am delighted to help share the perspectives of two arts leaders who as leaders have spoken on behalf of the arts many times and who will share with us how they were forced to pivot in the pandemic, pushing ahead through hurricane force obstacles uh, the question, how do we move forward, is, of course, on everyone's mind. Let me first introduce Stephanie Gallart. Stephanie is the CEO and Producing Artistic Director of American Stage Theatre Company. Since 1977, American Stage has been dedicated to telling meaningful, compelling stories with integrity and professionalism. Stephanie joined American Stage in 2015, and she is not just sitting behind a desk, as you see her tonight. As a long-term subscriber, I can personally attest that Stephanie has reinvigorated the company. And in her spare time, she directs and acts in outstanding productions. It didn't just happen here. Before coming to us, she found a capital stage in Sacramento where she was producing artistic director. On that West Coast, she was recognized as a leader with the Arts Innovation Award from the Sacramento Community Regional Foundation with an Arts Management Excellence Award for the Arts Business Council and she's a current member of the Nonprofit Leadership Center CEO Council. I just mentioned those three because they involve leadership. 
Um, obviously, Stephanie has stepped up to lead on behalf of the performing arts. And Steph, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank I you, John. Thanks for a nice introduction. You're welcome. Uh, my pleasure. And I also have the pleasure of welcoming Hank Hein. As executive director of the Dali Museum, Hank leads the most visited art museum in the Southeast. During his tenure, the Dali has created exhibitions and classroom opportunities for education. And to the delight of a local, national, and global audience, they have become a significant arts economic generator. Exhibitions made in partnership with other international museums have raised the profile of Dali's art and contextualized his role in the modern era, bringing increased understanding of Dali surrealism, but also the power of art to enhance the human condition. You may have read in Sunday's Tampa Bay Times that the Dali will host, I don't mean to steal your thunder if you want to talk about this, but you may have read in the Tampa Bay Times that the Dali will host the US premiere of the famed immersive Van Gogh exhibit. People have actually been telling me, I saw this in Paris. We're thrilled that it's here. I trust it will be a blockbuster despite COVID. As founder and co-director of the Dali Museum Innovation Labs, Hank has fused the science of creative problem solving with the transformational experience of visual art to expand individual and corporate capabilities in diverse pursuits. I have heard Hank speak over the years and I have always learned something and I admire his commitment to the arts and to arts education. Hank, thanks for being with us. John, so thank you for... Thank you for inviting us. And I, I just wanted to say how nice it is to be on a panel with Stephanie and to express uh, how much uh, I and, and this community appreciate what she has done uh, for American stage and for the culture of St. Petersburg, um, the strategic thing she's done to put that organization in great stead is uh, a, a matter of great admiration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan. That's, that's really kind of you. I appreciate that much. Well, we're very curious to hear how your institutions are doing during this pandemic. I have some questions and encourage you to keep the conversation going beyond yourselves. As the moderator, I love it when guests enjoy each other's company and share common ground. This is not like the debates. Interruptions are encouraged. I'm not just giving you each two minutes each to answer the question. Um, take it and run with it if you'd like. Uh, let me start with Stephanie. Please tell us how American Stage is surviving the pandemic for the near term and what you think the world will be like for you post-COVID. Well, I'll start with the, the near term because that's mostly, uh, you know, most of what we're able to, to see and have some level of confidence in. Um, and uh, the future is um, both exciting and, uh, and, 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 a little, and a little unnerving because it's, it's certainly, um, there's still a lot of question marks around what the future for the performing arts Looks like for the present moment, you know, we are in a place where we're uh, we're in our eighth month of um, uh, not being able to provide the kind of core programming that American Stage exists to provide to our community and has provided to our community for 43 years, and that is bringing people together in a shared space um, for the experience of professional live theater and quality arts education. Um, and so we are our the response uh, has been to really examine what the the core of our value to the community, our core kind of um, purpose, how we may serve the community now at this moment, and effectively have, have um, established new platforms for reaching our community and still using the uh, experience of storytelling and of arts education to bring the community together to um, kind of promote empathy and the exploration of the human experience to try and engage the community in, in dialogue. Um, and we've done that through um, a digital series. It's continuing to evolve. We're learning all sorts of things that in a live theater we didn't expect to be um, that we would be learning um, how to communicate storytelling that has the some of the essence of what is live theater, but doing it digitally and virtually. Um, so that's the, the work that we're doing now. We've just announced our 2020-21 season. We're calling it Reimagine and really embracing this, this time as an opportunity not only to reimagine the way in which we provide our programs, but also reimagine the role of the arts in our community and our society at a time when there's so much reckoning happening at a time when there's so much kind of uh, uh, dismantling taking this opportunity to reimagine in a very deliberate way the way in which we go about rebuilding our institutions thanks stephanie, thanks, stephanie. um hank if we may 
open with the same question. You want to tell us how the Dali is surviving the pandemic and what do you think about it? Well, and, and, and what does the future look like was, was part of your question too, I think. Uh, I think the future looks bright uh, for all the arts in our community. Um, the, the current situation is not so bright. And uh, uh, like American Stage, we've been challenged to find ways that we could bring what we want to bring to our public um, in a digital uh, online format. The, the problem is how to monetize that because our all of our business models have to do with uh, people being willing to buy a ticket or uh, some kind of subscription uh, to be part of our organizations and the work that we present to them. It's been difficult. Um, so we have not found the solution to that, how to monetize that. Uh, we are open now as we can be while protecting uh, the health and safety of our visitors. Uh, uh, of of whom there are more than we anticipated, but not enough to pay our bills. And yet we are all committed to, to going forward. One of the opportunities that we found from COVID though, is to serve the schools in a way that was online. And as they adapt to the new situation that they face with so many kids at home, uh, we are delivering uh, digitally uh, curated tours of our collection by live docents uh, to augment the experience that they can have uh, through the various and resourceful channels that the uh, county has put forward for them. So that's been rewarding. We have a, a dolly in the classroom program now that we, we think is of great value. Uh, meanwhile, we're waiting for a, a vaccine or remedial uh, pharmaceuticals such as may have been delivered to the president uh, whether they are uh, from uh, fetuses or not, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, find a way forward, and that's that's the light at the end of the tunnel. Boy, thank you, um, Stephanie. What do you think is next for our arts community, and uh, how do you think St. Pete will be able to adapt and continue to grow? You know, I sh I share Hank's optimism about about the future, our future as an arts community. Um, I think that one of the things that we have in front of us is the necessity of being um, cre creative, which is something we, we know how to do, although none of us predicted that this was the manner through which we need to learn to apply our creativity. Um, but to, to innovate, which is a word that may be a little bit overused right now, but is apt for a community that has increasingly defined itself around what it has to offer in its arts landscape. And that identity grew in St. Pete in a very authentic way. And, uh, and I think that because of the authentic authenticity through which the, the arts have evolved here, um, while we are the sector that will in many ways be one of the last to return to a level of, of normalcy in term of, terms of the way that we do our, our uh, conduct our operations and I, and I use the word normalcy in a you know with the caveat being I don't think that we will return to things being exactly the way they were um, in in either of our mediums Hanks or or um, ours in American stage but I think that understanding that the appreciation for for that which the arts provide us as an opportunity for catharsis on the other side of this for more holistically looking at the way in which the arts touch our lives and need to touch our lives. Um, and the way in which the city as a, as a whole can integrate in a more comprehensive way, arts business, arts commerce, and the arts content itself. And that's a little bit broad, but I think that there's just, uh, you know, I think a really an opportunity here for when we come back to uh, a more uh, robust kind of open and open city um, to really just define ourselves as a city of the arts in a way that is uh, where we know what we're talking about on, on a deeper level and we have a, a greater sense of purpose going forward. So I see the arts as being much more central to um, the day in and day out functioning of our city in ways that look like, um, as to, to um, what you know, Hank brought up, the, the ways in which our, our young people are educated, but also as ways that um, propel us forward in how we look at in, enhancing a sense of accessibility and um, making progress on the social justice front. I think the arts are gonna be a pivotal role in helping us heal as a community. 
um, and be instrumental to also bringing our local businesses back because we are connected to um, our restaurants and our hotels and tourism and we're, we're going to be an essential part of that recovery. And Hank, what do you think to add to that? Uh, John, there, there was some feedback there. What did you say? Yes. Thank you. I heard myself too. Um, again, uh, can you sort of add and expand, expand and perhaps from your perspective on what Stephanie was saying about what's next for our arts community and how we might be able to say he can adapt and grow that arts community? Well, we have all the resources of being a, a, a major force in the arts. We have uh, uh, more than one theater company, all excellent. We have uh, eight museums. I, I think that's right, John. Is that correct? Eight museums. Well, and, one new one coming uh, out. <laughs> and that's a lot of museums. Um, that's a lot of museums uh, for a city the size of St. Petersburg. Uh, we've got good weather. We've got incredible restaurants. Um, we've got a great waterfront. We've got private arts organizations that are bringing interesting things. Uh, so the future, it looks really bright to me and it's a, a great place, uh, a great place to experience the arts. And I hope it will be a great place to be an artist. Uh, that may be a little more problematic with rents going up. And, uh, I know that certain cities have taken the initiative of creating special, uh, zones where rent is controlled and, and artists are, are, uh, the inhabitants. Uh, it may take something like that um, to keep our, um, you know, the generation of art uh, alive by artists and performers, uh, dancers and musicians in our community. Well, thank you. you know, um, could, interestingly, add, please. So sorry. I just wanted to add to, you know, I think that um, the Dali stands is just such a, a tremendous example of how the arts and an arts institution can be such an, a significant, profound source of community and civic pride. When we look at the Dali and this beautiful building that that stretches near the water there, and and it it truly does give us a sense of community, a sense of purpose, and a sense of of, of civic pride. And I think that that's exemplary of what the arts can do at a time when a community is going through recovery and then rebuilding and regrowth. Um, whether you are a regular attendee at the Dali or at American Stage or, or any place else, we, we know that arts institutions give people a sense of pride in their community and really um, elevate the landscape and a sense of hope and optimism and a sense of, of belonging and being a part of something. So we need that and we are going to need that um, so, so very much as we start to carefully, cautiously come back together. And the arts are gonna be kind of right there to kind of bring people in and say, it's all gonna be okay because you know we're doing this together. That's what the arts provide. I love that. I love that, I love that, uh, that description of, of what arts organizations do in terms of being internalized by our, our, our public as theirs. You know, American stage belongs to people in this community. The Dolly belongs to them. And uh, it, that is so gratifying, but it's also so real. And it's, it constitutes the basis of our responsibility to, to thrive and uh, also to take very seriously the content of what we do, who we hire to present it, and uh, the way we conduct ourselves as, as citizens, as well as artistic uh, uh, managers. I would agree. Um, all of our arts and cultural community is very aspirational and I have never once felt that we didn't want to work together. And I think that's been a terrific asset for St. Petersburg. Um, as a follow up, Hank, how do you think, a uh, question from one of our um, alums, how has St. Pete become recognized on an international scale from a, from a variety of artists and means? Are there lessons learned from the weight that that prominence carries? Well, uh, prominence, you know, instills a, a responsibility. Um, I think we have uh, further to go. Um, uh, we at the Dali, you know, are, are proud that often when people abroad uh, think of St. Petersburg, they think of our museum. 
Uh, and and that's partly because of our programming, but it's also partly uh, we're you know carried on the back of of one of the handful of most famous artists of all times. So uh, we're glad to bring that. I think the prominence of the arts uh, here is is starting to be recognized. It's uh, it seems to be mentioned whenever uh, uh, cities um, like New York consider where people might go or what the finest destinations are. They mention the arts in St. Petersburg, along with our food sometimes, as well as, uh, you know, the uh, inveterate interest in our beaches, which we're happy about as well. I agree. Uh, let's move a little bit to the city and um, leadership. Uh, leadership St. Pete Alumni Association has a lot of leaders, graduates, of the program in St. Petersburg. Um, Stephanie, how do you think the city's leadership, and perhaps leaders from the classes of LSPAA can help you in our arts community? I love that question um, because they, um, it, they absolutely can by doing one really simple but uh, profound thing. And that is, at every conversation about the well-being of the city or a city initiative, anything pertaining to um, the direction that our city is going and the needs of our city, please always ask the question, what role do our arts play in this? And or what role can our arts play in this initiative, in this endeavor, in this need? Because the arts need to be at the table with every kind of essential part of what the evolution in the landscape of our city. Um, so that would be one thing to just remember to ask that question. And, and if you're not sure what the answers are, then there probably needs to be somebody else at that table who can provide some ideas, somebody who's re representing the arts community to bring that perspective. Because um, there's so much creativity and an integration that arts uh, leadership perspective can bring into those conversations that may not obviously be related to the arts. And then the second thing I would say is, um, is is create relationships with the arts organizations um, as both as as participants, you know, audience members, as as uh, museum uh, goers, members, um, and and just as um, as partners of you know 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 who your your arts leaders are in the community because we want to collaborate. Um, as Sean said, this is one of the most collaborative communities um, uh, that I, I've ever uh, seen or experienced, and um, so remembering to kind of link arms. Uh, with our with with one another is, is I think an essential part of um, making sure that our arts community has the level of kind of airtime, if you will, um, that will benefit the entire community. Hank, sort of the same question from the Dolly's point of view. With the, um, I would that? my answer would be Hallelujah, to Stephanie's. Uh, uh, keep the arts on on your lips. You know this community does define itself as an as an arts community, but uh, that can't be taken as uh, something that's assured. Uh, it is fragile. I mean, just look at what's happening right now with so many of our fellow organizations. You know, out of business essentially. You know, holding on by uh, the fingernails, uh, by the the support. So. When you think of this being an arts community, I think you have to ask yourself, to what uh, organizations do I subscribe? To whom at the year end when I'm doing my taxes do I donate? Uh, what have I visited uh, recently? And then further, what has been on my lips? What have I celebrated? What have I internalized? Because um, if we value the arts, we have to live them and we have to make the institutions live. Thank you, I would agree. Uh, in, in about two weeks, the St. Petersburg Arts Alliance is going to be launching a comprehensive art strategy over the next six months, surveys, interviews, um, steering committees, and all of that to build on just this question. And it is being supported by the St. Petersburg Downtown Partnership and the city of St. Pete. So we're going to, we're going to, we're, we're sending out our invitations and working on it now. And we will be asking all you, of course, and our audience here to show up, to participate, to tell us what they think we can do to better perhaps answer this question as we move forward. Um, we can't, we can't, uh, we, we, can, we can do the best we can with COVID by masking up and practicing social distancing. But beyond that, when we come out of that, what, what can we do to 
better support the uh, museums as a group, perhaps the theaters as a group, and then everyone together, the whole Art Walk group that we support as well. Um, Stephanie, um, and both of you, uh, I would value your thoughts on arts education and what you all are doing and how you're, you're uh, coping online. How's that working? How do you see that moving? You're, you're certainly committed to arts education. We are, absolutely. It is, the, it is at the heart of uh, American Stage. From the very, very beginning, American Stage was really founded on um, connecting um, our, the young people in our community to arts experiences. That was the initial thing that we, program that we had was a school tour that toured throughout Pinellas County, bringing um, uh, performances of children's literature to young people and giving them their very first live performance experience. And we've been doing that for our entire 43-year uh, um, uh, legacy history and this year is the first year that we just we can't go into the schools we can't send um, actors into the, the schools right now and um, so we have um, similar to what what Hank was describing earlier we're creating um, a digital version of um, a kind of reimagined fairy tales for for young people that um, teachers can use and we're trying to help you know really think about how can we help assist the teachers right now um, and give them additional tools because they're being challenged in so many different ways um, and making sure that you know one of the things that, that the arts does um, in addition to we know that the arts um, develop people's young people in terms of their abilities to their cognitive skills their abilities to communicate their ability to communicate um, they tend to perform better in all area academic areas kids who have high engagement in the arts tend to go are much more likely to go on to college etc but we know just on a day-to-day -day basis that kids who have engagement in the arts through school are more likely to show up and pay attention and be involved at school um, so just on that very simple uh, level, it is simple, but obviously pretty, um, pretty important, particularly now, um, we're looking for ways to continue to make sure we're providing the resources that are needed now. Um, but we have a, a really robust um, uh, uh, grouping of different kinds of initiatives for different kinds of different age levels, different um, kind of areas of, of performing arts, um, outreach programs that um, get us into schools that don't have arts programs. And um, we're finding ways to continue again to, to stay connected digitally, but we're really anxious to be able to have that return to that live experience with with young people because we really know it's, it's if essential to the whole of, of the human to have arts experiences, regardless of what uh, what that person ends up develop, choosing to follow in, in their in their adult life, um, that that just an arts experience and arts experiences make a person help us just to be more kind of holistic and well rounded. But it's also just essential to the future of the arts. If we aren't exposing young people and giving them positive arts experiences at a young age, then when when they are at, at, a, at a ticket buyer age or a potential board member or donor um, age range, then then they're not li likely to be um, leaning into the arts. So we need to build our future audiences and our future philanthropists um, um, for the arts as well. So um, we're super committed and gonna continue to find dynamic ways to do that in a meaningful way um, that looks a little bit different right now than it did a year ago. Thank you. Yeah. I've been at the uh, Dali, fortunately, and was visiting for one reason or another and to enjoy it. And both times of the last two times, uh, classes came just coming through. And the excitement of those kids, I wish I could have bottled it. I could have probably sold that energy. But and so it must be hard trying to convert that into online. Um, but Hank, we just talk a little bit more. I know you've got much more of an arts education support uh, outreach than I than I've experienced. Yeah, we, we've 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 invested in that for uh, many years, uh, and of course, the reason to invest it is that the future of arts uh, is you know uh, are now um, in their single digits, and if they don't have experiences of art, if they aren't uh, given um, um, ideas that arts matter uh, and and through the tasting of it they're they're not going to have an appetite it's not something that you can it's very difficult to acquire a taste for the arts later and we all have recollections of how it was brought into our lives through our families or through our friends and how meaningful that was 
So we've been investing in this. We have a, a, a trailer that goes to every public school in Pinellas and gives an experience of, of art, uh, usually in the form of another uh, discipline, like um, proportion and mathematics was our, our current uh, Dolly Mobile experience. And uh, that way, um, teachers uh, could get online uh, a study guide that would help them uh, give an introduction to what the kids' experience was going to be. And then there would be this immersive experience. Now, that's interrupted. So we're trying to find ways of delivering things online. We were lucky. We made a, a, a film that was part of our last exhibition, the one that was closed down uh, by COVID. It was called Midnight in Paris. And uh, the works on the walls were all borrowed from the Pompidou Museum, the National Museum of Modern Art in, in Paris, uh, of their surrealist collection. And we decided to try to humanize this uh, with a, a terrific playwright and uh, at great actors and made a film, produced a film um, in which we showed what it was like to be uh, in that milieu. It was an imaginary conversation between Gala and the impresario of, of surrealism, André Breton. And of course, uh, Gala prevails in this struggle to control the movement, which was uh, a great fantasy, but gave a, a sort of personal experience. And we find that uh, we have to augment uh, what we do in a COVID situation or in a normal situation with um, materials that help people, um, as Stephanie says, empathize and, uh, and uh, connect to others. So uh, we're trying to find every way we can to do this online now, but it is difficult. It's difficult. And if someone can find a way to monetize it, let uh, let all of us know, because that's going to be the lifeline uh, in the next crisis. Um, building on that a bit, you've certainly um, uh, involved uh, um, electronics, interactiveness. I'm not even sure of the right words, but technology. And uh, in, a, in a huge way to make things come alive. Are you continuing on that vein? Um, yes, we are. Uh, online? It, yes, uh, it, we found that um, there are, they really lower the threshold for people to enjoy what is uh, the experience of of a silent, unique, uh, two dimensional work on the wall. If it can somehow be brought alive and uh, given language uh, that allows them to enter it or enter the life of the artist more easily. We find that the threshold that keeps people from being in dialogue with a work of art is much lowered. Uh, so technology has been part of every exhibit that we've done uh, since for the last 10 years or so, some kind of interactive experience. And they've uh, come to such a point of such a culmination and uh, uh, an assembled body of works that we need space to keep providing them. And so this is why uh, we have formed this plan to create uh, an extension to the museum, a, a freestanding building that would be all interactive digital arts that would be a kind of an introduction to the uh, uh, analog works that will be there silently mm -hmm. waiting to be in a different kind of dialogue with them when they come to the museum. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I, is it me watching and reading the various uh, emails that are coming out promoting shows? Are people sort of, to use your word, uh, reimagining theater to be more visual on screen? You know, it's hard to say that there's a collective gestalt yet, frankly. There's been so much um, trying to uh, trying to maintain our organizations and 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 I want to I want to underscore what what Hank has communicated. You know, I think one of the the things um, that we do in the arts that can be our downfall, and I'm going to steal this. I think it was Gene Reynolds um, uh, from Pinellas County Schools who who said this to me recently that sometimes in the arts what we do to the to the app to the public we make it look really easy and that belies the work and the effort and the discipline and the skill and the the amount of dedication um, 
uh, that goes into from the administrative side, leadership side to the pro to the content creation. And so we're collectively as an industry right now um, taking all of that, all of those resources that, that we have to figure out how to do things differently that still somehow keep us connected in a way that's specific to our medium. And it's tough because, you know, the thing that I said when we, when the pandemic first, we first paused our programming and there was immediately a lot of pressure of put out content, do some, get some content out there. And, um, and I, you know, really wanted to kind of take a beat. And I, you know, my, my, my thought was, you know, who does digital content really well? Uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime and a whole bunch of others who that's what they do. So our, our task is to figure out how to make sure that we're doing, we're creating content that's meaningful to the people who are coming together to experience it and still creating a sense of community around that. And we're still figuring it out. So I, I think it's, it's, I would be getting ahead of myself to say that, that there's this huge, now we're all going to do it this way. But I will say that there were a, a lot of naysayers never going into the digital platform kind of realm among theater companies that are changing their minds because this is lasting us so much longer. And one of the positives that's coming out of that is there's a lot of kind of linking of creative uh, imaginations across outside of our ge you know, geographical, what would have pre previously been geographical limitations. Um, so we can have audiences viewing from all over the country, all over the world. And also we can share content with other uh, performing arts organizations with one another's audiences and membership. So you're starting to see that kind of um, imagining things on, on that level and kind of how do we redefine community? Because I think that's, that's the thing about theater that we want to hold on to no matter what, no matter what the way in which technology impacts us in the short term and in the long term is, is making sure that we create a sense of community around the work that we do. And that's making sure that people have ways of communicating and connecting with one another through that experience that they're having with the art. Well said. This is a question, another question from LSP AA. Um, what is your leadership style? And I wonder if there's commonalities, differences, but for you, what would you think? What's the, and, and also maybe perhaps what's the best leadership advice someone ever gave you? I'll start with Those that. are hard ones. Yeah. I know. I, I was waiting for you to go answer. first on that one, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gee, I, you know, I don't have a deliberate style. I guess I, uh, my wife and I joke about um, the way we live our lives are like two people falling down a set of stairs. Um, you reach to find stability. You try to keep your goals in mind, but uh, there's a lot you can't control. And uh, there's a certain spontaneity, I guess, to my leadership style. Um, what I would recommend to others is it may not be what uh, those I lead would say I do. <laughs> so it's a, it's an ironic thing, but I think you, you need to have a, a big vision. Um, I think you need to love the people that you lead and the organization that you lead. You, you have to believe in it and believe in them. Um, I think the reason I've been at the Dolly so long is I believe in the potential of this museum to create change in people's lives, to not just um, uh, kind of random change, but deliberate change, to show them that they have the tools um, to reimagine themselves and reimagine the world. Uh, and when you find that in your organization, then um, you just try to keep your hand on the railing and keep the thing stable and keep going towards the goal. Thank you. I'm going to flip it over to Stephanie. I think keep your hand on the railing is good. Just, just good art, certainly good arts leadership advice. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had the, the, the opportunity to do, uh, go through a lot of different leadership training programs. And so I can kind of speak to it from, um, speak to leadership style from the perspective of, you know, if you're looking at, um, 
you know, what are kind of the, the seven styles of leadership that are that are um, most discussed for sort of sort of thing. I can speak about it from from that loosely, but I would rather talk about the in the trenches kind of what it really is to lead. So I think that from the kind of textbook, what leadership style um, that I'm 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 a I'm a strategic, you know, I think in my in my um, my uh, process and the way that I the way that I lead um, my my role is both operational and 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 financial business as well as being um, the artistic leader um, and so being able to marry those things and integrate those things in a way that is strategic is um, is important to me and then on a people kind of um, working with with people I think I've developed this has evolved and I think my leadership style continues to evolve has evolved um, that I have more of a kind of a coaching leadership style with uh, members of my staff and with my with um, uh, members of my my team. I think in terms of the the you know I think being understanding and being being both both humble and um, trusting yourself at the same time um, that's something that I've learned and kind of have grown into. Um, I think that that's the thing that that I can say with the most um, most sense of, of 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 ownership is that I trust myself. And um, that doesn't mean that I uh, that I don't have to go back and say, "Oh, I really got that one wrong." In fact, it's it's because I trust myself that I'm pretty comfortable saying that. Um, so maybe a, you know to to follow uh, Hank's lead, one of the kind of pieces of advice, leadership advice that that I would give is also going back to that that passion piece and that why. And for me, it's really about being steadfast and vigilant in your why, why you're doing what you're doing, why you're leading this organization at this time and this and and then really having a, a deep connection and vigilance about about that why and being steadfast and consistent there. But being curious and flexible in the how. Um, and understanding that the how you are effective in accomplishing the why um, may not look the same each day and, and in each different situation. We're learning that, you know, in, in, in uh, full color right now. Notes on Thank this, you. this is really good. I, I love that about <laughs> uh, steadfast in your why, but flexible in your how. That's, that's beautiful. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> My sense we have is a, that uh, there has We have been... a program that John, you, you hinted at, um, that kind of came out of just observing who we were. And I think introspection is a big part of leadership, you know, not just personal introspection and certainly that, but uh, you know, looking into your organization, trying to find what really is at the core of it. What are its, you know, the fibrous strengths there at the, that, you know, keep the heart beating and what is that? Um, and, and we were just kind of thinking about uh, how Dolly could uh, do so many things and keep, the consistency of his vision, his voice, his, if you will, brand. And, um, you know, he was a, a, a performer and he was um, a videographer and he was a painter and he made prints and he wrote a novel and he designed hats and he was an architect, you know, and uh, if you ever saw him on What's My Line, he even said that he was an athlete, but uh, <laughs> he was, he was so many things, and yet there was this consistent personality, this consistent brand. I thought, you know, that's a very, the, the structure there is like we learn in business school. That's a horizontal monopoly. Um, that's mm -hmm. Apple computer and Apple software and, and Apple music. Mm -hmm. it, the, you know, the elegant design, but going far afield. And so um, I realized there were lessons for business and for organizational development in Dali and started this program called the Innovation Labs. And uh, so we use lessons from art, particularly from Dali, uh, that show people, um, we'll give them ideas of how they might see things in a different way and uh, try to reshape their organizations and ultimately themselves. So we teach leadership even though we don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> we well, know what it looks given like. everything yes uh, well there's certainly a, a need for leadership i've seen uh, ever i think i was asked several weeks ago to moderate this and i've seen that word 
millions of times, of course, now over the next, over the past three weeks, even today, there's a whole section, a section in the Wall Street Journal entitled leadership, you know, so I think people are, are feeling a vacuum of leadership and are, are, and are hoping or looking to leadership to help us, you know, emerge from this pandemic. Um, uh, 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 my last question would be, uh, is I actually, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if I'm running over or not. And it was 45 minutes of this and 15 for questions. But my last one would be from, from both of you. Um, how do you encourage leadership within your organization? One thing we kind of don't have is a, is a, is a deep bench of future leaders in the arts and cultural world. And, and do, you, do you encourage that? How do you, how do you reach out? Um, how do you see that evolving? Um, Stephanie, why don't we go back to you? You know, one of the things that we do at American Stage internally is we use the word leadership regularly. Um, and, and we don't use it exclusively about um, people who are, uh, you know, like myself or the, the leadership team in the organization. Um, we use it in terms of thinking about our role and our responsibility in the community to be leaders in the community. Um, we talk about it in terms of um, how each of us kind of show up in the work that we do um, as kind of self-leadership, um, individual leadership. Um, and then there are things that we do. And by that, I mean, you know, really, um, I think uh, thinking, about, thinking about the work that we do in terms of a sense of greater purpose and greater responsibility. Um, so there is a mindset component to it. The actual kind of uh, skill set development component, component of leadership, which I don't think can be, um, I, I think there's, there's so much more that we can and, and need to be doing in this community, specifically around arts leadership, because as a city of the arts, um, in order to continue to grow that and to, and to make sure that we recover and, and, um, and really thrive outside of, um, on the other side of COVID, uh, arts leadership is, is essential to that process. Internally, we have, um, uh, you know, recently created, the last couple of years at American Stage, created a little bit more of a leadership structure. So we're not a very big organization. Um, we're actually, right now, we're smaller than, than we were a year ago. Um, but creating um, some internal um, layers of, of leadership and then providing some um, uh, access to, um, to, to leadership training. There's not specific in um, this area a lot of direct access to, to arts leadership, but there are national organizations, um, specifically theater communications group for the theater. And then locally, I can't say enough about just there's some great nonprofit leadership um, uh, resources. Nonprofit Leadership Center is terrific. That's John mentioned. I'm a member of, I'm a part of the CEO circle and I've gone through um, trainings with them as well as their Community Foundation of Tampa Bay. Um, Nonprofit Leadership Center has also created leadership development for um, uh, high potential um, nonprofit um, employees. Um, and, then, and then we've added um, in the last four years or so at American Stage an apprenticeship program that really is about learning leadership by doing, and then more recently, a, a, a leadership fellowship program. So um, those are all the ways that we look to um, try and make sure that we're thinking about succession and leadership in the way that we conduct ourselves, um, the way in which we think about our relationship to the greater kind of role of American stage in, in our community. But it would be terrific to see, um, I think there's, to see some things like potentially uh, collaborations among arts organizations in a leadership uh, development program. I've talked about that with the uh, Florida Professional Theaters Association, potentially a statewide program. And then I think there's more that we could um, look to our universities to um, partner with them. Um, and I think that there's, a, there's some willingness there. I know that from conversations that I've had. I think we just need to, um, to push that forward and identify that this is a real, a real need now and it's going to be an increasing need in our sector. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, Stephanie, you mentioned the universities, and it's true. I think we still have uh, a kind of ailment in our academic systems where we uh, teach people to be, uh, or we help them find their own way to be artists, but we don't uh, help them find a way to um, to lead others or to teach, or, to, or uh, other than being examples, which of course is a, a primary way of leading to be an example. But uh, when I was in, I went through an interdisciplinary doctoral program, and 
we were creating uh, writers and artists that were going out. And you know what they would do, of course, is get jobs as teachers. But there was not uh, any pedagogy. There was no teaching of, of how to teach. And uh, so in my last year, we started something like that. And uh, what I do now, in, in addition to taking on interns, is I ask people to uh, explore something beyond their own um, beyond their own metier. Um, if you like to hike, you know, what is it um, that you can bring uh, f the lessons from that that can, it, you know, in a kind of triangulation can apply to uh, being successful in your role and thus um, being able to, to lead as a, as a successful uh, manager. Um, I think that the, uh, the empathy uh, for your peers is, is something we try to instill. That is, understand how hard everybody's role is to make this thing work and learn about their jobs. And in that way, uh, that whole process of empathy builds a sense of responsibility and communication, I think, which is at the core of leadership. I love the science behind uh, what Stephanie is saying, though, and I, I think that um, that there uh, are great resources now and uh, that uh, one who wants to r rise in any field should avail themselves of that. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't say, and that's what Leadership St. Pete is all about and bringing 40 some odd people together every year for, mm, I could be wrong, seven, eight months visiting and learning about leadership and bringing them all together from all, all businesses, including the arts. Uh, in St. Petersburg and from my class back in, back in 2000 and whatever, uh, I still see people on the street that I network with from my class. And I'm sure that happens with everyone. But it was a great introduction for me when I moved to St. Petersburg and it was a, a great introduction to meeting other leaders of different places, such as my very first meeting was the Florida Holocaust Museum and, and meeting them and talking about leadership in diversity. So um, I, I, I'm gonna stop here. I, there's a, uh, uh, Amy, are, are there questions from the audience that we should be putting up here for the last few minutes? Ah, and here is one. Can you both see that? How yes. is our organization preparing for the return of people to your spaces? That's a really good question about how, to, how will audiences feel comfortable returning to the arts? Um, who would like to take that on? Well, we're, we're in the midst of it, so I'll, I'll start. Uh -huh. We opened in July, John, and uh, we, of course, for the safety of our visitors and the safety of our guests, require masks. And there were challenges to that. Um, mm -hmm. I love our security director who was asked, who's told by one of our visitors, you're going to have a problem with me because I'm not wearing a mask. And he just said, we're not going to have a problem with you. You're just not coming in without a mask. And uh, we've had to be adamant about that, uh, but uh, I think that the understanding of the efficacy of them has increased. Uh, we also are keeping distance. We had to change the way the movement was through the museum in terms of elevators, uh, access, egress. Um, we had to uh, remove paintings from some areas where they were, there was congestion. And uh, we've frankly had to limit ourselves, turn people away at times uh, because we can't accommodate them safely. And we're anticipating a lot of interest in this um, projected mapping of Van Gogh with music. And we're, we're you know, time ticketing, we're, we're selling out, but we're keeping those numbers uh, low so that we can assure the health and safety of all our guests. That, unfortunately, that's not gonna, uh, we can't sustain that forever. So we're all looking forward to that light at the end of the tunnel where we yes. can go back to our practices. Right, Stephanie? Oh, gosh. I mean, I miss it so much. And, you know, it's it's um, all of the work that we're doing to, to just keep connected to the community is special. It's meaningful. It's it's deepening us and, and, and challenging us in new ways. But there is absolutely no replacement for um 
bringing people together in a shared space um, to experience art. And um, so we're thinking about it all of the time. We've been working on our health and safety, you know, we're, uh, uh, processes and policies and return to performances since March. <laughs> and it keeps evolving as, as the science keeps evolving and as the situation keeps evolving. Right now for us, you know, one of the, the, the key considerations, we can't really even think about bringing audiences back into the building until we can um, guarantee the safety of our performers working together in close proximity. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that is specific to the performing arts and, you know, and it's not even about having actors be able to come in one night and do a performance. It's, it's day after day after day after day of rehearsals and performances. So what do you need there? You need to know that every single day they come in, that they're COVID free. Mm -hmm. So until we can get to a place where we can test on a regular basis with a quick turnaround of results, um, we're looking at you know one person shows um, or doing social distancing performances. So we're really eager for testing to continue to evolve in terms of the access, the affordability and the turnaround time of results so that we can safely say, we know that you know the actors can feel safe in that setting together, the actors, the director, you know the creative team themselves because we are an intimate art form. We work closely, yeah. physically closely yeah. with, with one another. And then there's the part of bringing audiences in and we'll certainly, when we first bring audiences back, we'll be doing space, um, spaced out seating, masks will absolutely be required. We'll be doing different kinds of entrances into the theater. We won't be doing hard copy pr uh, programs. We'll be doing all digital you know, programs. Um, and um, so the, all, all of the measures, you know, like like the ones that, that Hank described and, and, and others that are specific to our venue and our art form. Um, but Right now, we're, we're uh, looking forward to getting to a place where we can um, bring the actors together in a, in a rehearsal room. Thank you. Is there another question appearing on our screen? How has leadership St. Pete uh, been changed by the COVID, John? Or Paul? <laughs> Yeah, that, uh, well, perhaps one of the things they're doing is presenting these things online. These used to be set in a conversation setting. And I know I, uh, I feel everything about the fourth wall in front of me just interviewing you two. You know, I'm sure uh, it's just extremely difficult, especially with the little clicks and ticks and tucks that the computer is going us through. Um, I, I, but I think Leadership St. Pete, I believe yesterday was the deadline for applications for this year's round and um, and they are going to go through and and last year they switched from a person to person uh, type format to going online and ultimately graduating 40 students or so so I, I, I hesitate to speak for them Paul would know much better than me but it, um, they are continuing on. It's one of the country's oldest, if not oldest leadership organizations was Leadership St. Pete here. And uh, it certainly contributed to the flavor of our city. Um, how do we see the arts helping people heal? Is probably a great closing question. Mm. For me, it would be coming together. I'm not sure how we can do it without that, but um, what do you think? Yeah, when we when we feel safe coming together again, that doing so through the experience of the arts is so life affirming, and I think that having life affirming experiences as a collective, um, in and of itself, can be tremendously healing. As it relates to live theater, um, we have some stories to tell that will be a part of our catharsis, a part of our kind of. Uh, figuring out what just happened <laughs> to us all, what happened in our world, and not just from the pandemic standpoint, but we've become so, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous and, and a little overstated to say that we've become divisive, but hey, we've become pretty divisive. And, um, and I think that, that the fact that we can't physically come together is, is I, I worry a little bit that that's, kind of creating that now that physical distance is, is only highlighting and, and kind of um, exacerbating a sense of, of difference and, um, and, and disconnect. Um, we're in the, uh, a, a racial justice movement that I, I think most of us hope is, is more than a movement, that this is a, a, a moment where true change is going to build and build and build in a way that has a tempo to it that is much more um, appropriate to 
our humanity today and what we know and understand today. So the arts are, are going to be an opportunity for just by virtue of bringing people back together, but through live theater and storytelling and reflecting back to ourselves and one another, our world, um, this, the, what we've experienced, seeing our experiences reflected back to us is in and of itself cathartic. Um, it's why in therapy they have you talk about what you went through, right? Because that's how you process. Um, and storytelling can provide that for you in a really kind of safe way. And then doing it among other people who also went through that with you is a, is, is a way of really creating a bond. And then the other part of that is telling stories that reflect the lives and perspectives of those whose um, lives and stories have not been given, amplified in the way that they deserve to be, um, is a way to help expand us and help us achieve a level of understanding that I think can, can unite us in a way that we are so longing for right now. So I believe so passionately that this is going to be an opportunity for the arts to become so, so much more endeared um, to our community because people will, will have that a higher value for its its role in really um, inoculating us from the pain. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you both very, very much. I think uh, this, this leads us to how the arts can gently reawaken our city from COVID as we, as we go forward. Um, it's been my pleasure to be here with the two of you. I, I'm, I'm not sure how to uh, actually close the session other than to thank LSPAA, you all, anyone who's watching, we don't really see any of that on this, this, this platform, but uh, thanks for being with us, those of you who have stayed with us. And if you obviously have any questions that haven't been answered, you're welcome to email me, I'll forward them along and we will continue the conversation. So I wish everyone a wonderful evening, stay safe, mask up, stay six feet apart, and I look forward to sitting in the theater and visiting the next show that's coming into the Dolly. I'll say goodbye. Thank you, John. Well Thanks. Here. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Hank. Thank you, John. Take care. Pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye.